So I'm going to start. Great. And hey guys, thanks. Hi, I'm Rob Kelman. Um, and Rachel is with me today. I think a lot of you on the call know me or you know have uh, colleagues who know me and introduce you virtually to me. I've got a, uh, a training company and a coaching company. We do agile training and coaching in Farmington Hills. Um, virtual now these days. So this is what we're up to, Michigan Technology Services. Um, and what I've done over the last few months, I've had a series of meetups for my friends here in Michigan, as where a lot of us are working from home. So I keep us educated and we're doing them for free. Um, I gotta tell you, it's the first time we're running a, uh, a meetup specifically for women and um, their allies. Uh, I, I saw Rachel did a, um, a, a course, an agile leadership course for women. And I thought, boy, that would be really cool to bring something like that to Michigan, at least, you know, get a conversation started. Um, she works with Pete Barron, so I know a lot of you guys know, because um, he's taught a lot of the agile leadership workshops that some of you have taken. Um, I'm gonna let her introduce herself and her full background, but uh, Rachel Weston Rowell is a certified scrum trainer and then she teaches and coaches senior business leaders. Um, the game plan will do about 40 minutes of a presentation and then about 20 minutes of question and answers and we'll wrap it up at the end. Um, if uh, you have questions, we have the chat feature and uh, Rachel, I'm gonna let you decide when you wanna, you know, do that or not, but yeah. I'm gonna sit back and then uh, let you run with things, but thanks guys. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. I'm really excited. Let me um, share my screen here. Hopefully I did that right. Um, can everybody see that? Good, all right, cool. Well, welcome everyone. Um, uh, as Rob said, I, have, um, I, I do a lot of work around agile leadership and just leadership in general, but I also am very passionate about talking about um, women in leadership and women in agile leadership. Um, and I, in my learnings in this space, I came across this concept called the double bind that really um, hit home for me a lot of the experiences I've had and that I've seen other women experience. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm so excited that we have a group of women and men. I think having our allies with us and understanding this too helps us um, move these things forward. So I'm just, I'm really grateful for you all being here. So um, uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado. I'm actually a Colorado native. We're, we're a, a rare breed. So, uh, so here is one. And um, <laughs> um, I, uh, I am an executive team coach. And so what that means is I like to work with um, senior leadership teams and help them figure out how to be better together in service to their organizations. And that's a combination of figuring out how to have better relationships and work more effectively together. So learn things about collaboration, but then also to develop the practices that they need to scale their companies. So just how to, how to be better at communicating and forming strategy and deploying strategy and all that stuff. Um, and I've been an agile coach since 2006, which is where I sort of learned the cores of what I do now. But then as I grew in my career and eventually became an executive myself, I was like, these are the people that I need to teach this stuff to, because if they can get it, we'll make the rest of the company better. So um, I spend a lot of time with those folks and trying to help them out. Um, so my superpower, um, my mentor told me is facilitation. Um, so I try to give myself a pat on the back for that as comfortable as it may be. Um, but I love facilitating. I love making great meetings. Um, I love making spaces for people to work together. I truly believe meetings do not have to suck. Um, so uh, that's, that's how I spend a lot of my time. Um, I also, as I said, I have a puppy and I have a nine-year-old daughter um, and I do improv, although not anymore. Now I just watch a lot of TV. All right, so that's me. Um, so let's get started. Um, and if you guys have questions as we're going, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and I'll, Rob, maybe you can help me sort of pay attention to that as we go. Um, okay, so what is the double bind? What is this concept we're talking about? So um, I'm gonna show you actually a quick video that I think does a nice job of illustrating this. And hopefully the audio still works. Maybe Rob, once it starts, if you'll give me a thumb up, thumbs up if you can hear the audio, that'd be great. Familiar faces, worn out places, worn out faces, bright and early for their daily races, going nowhere, going nowhere, and their tears are 
filling up their glasses. No expression, no expression. Mad world, mad world. All right, so that is actually, um, weirdly enough, a Pantene commercial. <laughs> they did a whole series of these on, um, on women and um, working against labels against women, which is pretty cool. Um, but what you saw there is really an expression of what is the double bind, which, um, and what, the, what it is is that we have in our society um, stereotypical understanding of what it means to be an acceptable woman and we have a stereotypical understanding of what it means to be an expected leader. And unfortunately, the Venn diagram of those two things doesn't really overlap. So when you show up into the world as a woman and as a leader, um, there are expectations that we have about how you will be a woman. Things like being kind and nurturing and nice and smiling and friendly um, and mothering, right? And then there, as a leader, we have expectations about what those behaviors look like. Things like being, you know, decisive and assertive and firm and, you know, maybe even a little, uh, you know, sometimes even a little aggressive or, you know, pushing for your ideas. And these two worlds do not really intersect. And that is the double bind. The double bind is if you show up as a woman and a leader, if you do engage in behaviors that amplify your good leadership, you are perceived as an unacceptable woman. And if you show behaviors that amplify your womanness, you are perceived as a bad leader. Okay? So that's what we're talking about here is the double bind for women of like, damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Be a good woman, be a bad leader. Be a good leader, be a bad woman. Make sense? So how, how this expresses, um, you can see it in a lot of different ways. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. Um, sometimes it's just in the language we use, and that's what the Pantene ad was really showing, is that when a woman shows up and she is being you know, excited and enthusiastic, then she gets labeled as like a cheerleader, right? She's not a leader. She's like, yay, she's a cheerleader. Um, but if she's like more aggressive and firm in her decisions, well, now she's an ice cream, right? She's just too harsh. Why is she so mean? You know, why doesn't she just, you know, smile more, right? Or um, if you are a, a leader, a strong leader, then, you know, she's probably single and lonely. Who would ever want to be with her? Like these, these terms, these stereotypes are very common. This is actually from a Forbes article where they researched the, the most common and kind of powerfully powerfully negative stereotypes about women right that we get when we're forceful about something that we're angry about it um, that one especially gets used a lot for women of color um, tough right it's like it, maybe it's good to be tough and yet somehow if you're tough in a woman then you're not actually acceptable as a woman anymore um, and then if you show up and you have a lot of passion around something it's not passion you're emotional um, or if you show up and you're trying to be a strong leader, no, you're too masculine, right? That's, that's no longer acceptable anymore. Um, or if you are bringing some of your vulnerability to bear, then you're weak. Um, or if you try to push for something you want, you're conniving. Um, or worst you know, of all, maybe you're the only woman and you're just a token. You don't really deserve to be there. It's just that they needed a woman in that position. And so these stereotypes exist and they they pigeonhole women and they lock them into situations where we cannot bring our best selves as leaders. So the language is one of the easiest ways to observe these stereotypes existing in our world and the way that we kind of react to women and given the different behaviors that they exhibit when they are showing up as leaders. Um, I'll give you a good example that I've noticed recently of how a word can be used in leadership and can initially be a word that we would more associate with femin the feminine or with acceptable womanness, but we wanna start using it in the kind of leadership space. And so we have to start redefining it. So that word is vulnerability. I don't know if any of you have read the work of Brene Brown or seen a lot of the work that's come out in recent years about the importance of vulnerability at work and the importance of vulnerability for leaders. 
Well, what I observe with that is that vulnerability definitely starts as a word that's like, oh, vulnerability, maybe that's weak or it's soft. It definitely has a feminine sort of um, cast to it, but we want to sort of apply it in the leadership space. So what do we do? We say, oh no, you know what's true about vulnerability? It takes courage. You have to be brave to be vulnerable. You have to be very strong to be vulnerable, right? We have to shift the actual word out of the traditional stereotypical woman space into the leader space in order to make it useful in terms of leadership. It can't exist as it previously did and be acceptable. It has to be reframed. So that's a nice, I think a good example of how you can sort of see where these worlds do not overlap very effectively. Um, so the double bind, just to reiterate, it's that as a woman and a leader that you are either perceived as too nice to be an expected leader or too authoritative to be an acceptable woman. That's the, that's the balance that we're trying to deal with. So how do we deal with this? Well, one of the challenges I think that I see a lot and I've experienced a lot is really which comes first. And when I walk into a room, um, what do people see? Well, they see that I'm a woman, right? <laughs> like, they're not like, that's a leader. I wonder if it's a woman too, right? That's not the, that's, our eyes are not fooled, right? By, by the vision of me. So the first thing that happens when people see me is they think I'm a woman. And so all the stereotypes that exist in our society of how I should then behave pop up. So I, th I share this image because this is just me searching images on Google for women. And what I think is most in interesting about these search results are the categories that you can click on at the top. Right? When we search women, we get beautiful and body and most beautiful and chest and natural, right? So that's, and this is their algorithm, right? This is what people are searching around women. Well, when we search for leader, right, we get business and boss and manager. And I think what I see in the pictures here are a lot of suits and ties, right? So even in our imagery, we have these embedded understandings and beliefs about what these things mean and how we think about them in their mind, in our mind. And the, the sort of insidious nature of these things is that you can be a feminist, you can be a supporter of women, you can not believe in, in you know, perpetuating gender bias, and you will still engage in sexism and gender bias because it is built into the system. Because you see it every day, it's like the air you breathe. It's everywhere around us. And so even when we are adamant that we do not want to do these things and do we do not want to support these things it happens inside of our mind because it is part of the society that we live in it is there around us all the time and so overcoming it is an activity of great effort and work right because it's built in so this is a place actually where I'd love to get some of your input through the chat. So, um, and I'm gonna have to go out of presentation mode for a second, but I'd love to, for you guys to throw out some words or concepts that you think are in our society are positive stereotypes of men. Like, so I'm not looking for negative ones. I'm looking for like, what are the ways we think about men and we think positively about them as stereotypes in our society? So drop some, drop some words in the chat. There's no wrong answers here. Okay, so, so I got strong, smart, oops, boy, I'm misspelling smart, that's weird. Protector, nice, dedicated, I probably won't get these all, but I'm doing my best. You guys are throwing out awesome words, tough. Aggressive, provider, reliable, awesome, awesome. I hope people are looking at the chat because there's more and more and more good words here. Um, I'm gonna add this with capable. Okay, so we get this amazing list, right? All these wonderful words that we would immediately say these stereotypically associate with men. Um, and so I want you to think about these words and hold them in your mind. And now think about what happens when women exhibit these behaviors. So let's go back to it for a second. Just think through if you see a woman being strong or smart or tough or aggressive or you know, being a provider, we can start to feel some of the, what I'm saying, like it's in the air we breathe, that 
even if we don't believe these things in our heart, we can feel the stereotypes, we can feel the pull of like, I have seen in movies, or I have heard people say, or I have seen in my family, or I have heard in songs, these things that make those, those stereotypes of men feel wrong when we apply them to women, right? Something feels wrong. So let's do the same thing. What are some positive stereotypes of women? So same thing, pop in the chat. What are some words you would use there? So nurturing, beautiful, strong, kind, caring, sensitive, empathetic. These are great. Oh, you guys are awesome. Sweet, gentle. Okay, awesome. Oh, so many good ones. Thank you. All right, so same thing now, Hold, holding these concepts in your mind, what happens when leaders exhibit these behaviors? So let's go back to the list. You see a leader. What do we think when we see a leader being this? Twitter is a great place to observe this particular set of, <laughs> of negative reactions. Right? And again, it's, it's not that we don't value these things, but we have these reactions. Yeah, so somebody's in the chat, they're mushy, they're weak, they're a pushover, they're bossy. Right? We get these negative reactions to, yeah, oh, I love soft skills. I was just thinking about that today. Like how many times have we heard the word soft skills? Like, huh, soft skills. And immediately that's like, that's a, that's a woman thing right? That's the, not the overlap with the leader thing. And if we want it to overlap with the leader thing, we have to reframe it to be like, well, soft skills are actually the hardest skills, right? That's how we have to say it. Cause we couldn't just accept that soft skills matter, right? They have to be reframed to be acceptable for leaders. All right. So let me go back into presentation mode. Does that work? You guys see it still, Rob? Okay. All right. So as I was looking at this, I really wanted to look at the research and understand kind of what's at the core of this. And, and can this, is there, is there evidence? Like we feel this, I think, as humans in our society, but I wanted to know more about like what's really happening here. So there's a woman named Madeline Heilman. She has amazing research. Um, I heard her first on the podcast Hidden Brain, which I totally love and would recommend. Um, he, uh, Shankar Vedrantham is the host of that, and he did an episode on the double bind. Um, and she talked about her research, and I think one of the interesting things that she talked about is that what they would do is take um, a set of qualifications and backgrounds, like a resume, and they would put it in front of people um, for the same job, and, but they would change the gender of the person. And as soon as they changed the gender, um, and this was especially within the world of jobs that historically were assumed to um, be taken by men. So t male, typically assumed male jobs. So if they put these resumes in front of people, um, what, when they would change the gender to a woman, the reviewers would think that that woman was less competent than a man. Same qualifications, same background, but they would rate the woman as less competent simply because she was a woman, right? So that I think is the first like research example that I saw that I was like, okay, so this is not just beyond just making me feel bad and making other women I know feel bad, which sucks in and of itself. It's actually detrimental to our ability to get jobs, to get leadership roles, right? Because we are already assumed to be less competent, even with the same background. It means we have to do even more, be even better to even get qualified for the same roles as men. And her research went even further because what she said is sometimes when you look at a woman's performance, you can't deny her competence. She is competent. You've seen it. The performance is there. There's no way to just like wash it away. And what happens then in the research she did is that people have very negative reactions. What they see is that this competent woman in a male role is very disliked. And I think these words at the end are really matter that she's bitter, she's quarrelsome, she's selfish, she's deceitful, right? These really, this really negative language around women's competence, like when it really shows up, especially in roles that are perceived to be um, typically populated by men. So the cost of that, as I've reflected on it and as I looked at the research, is that women have to prove they are competent over and over again. There is not a baseline assumption 
that our background and experience means of course we're ready for this job. Of course we're capable of doing that. It's this repeated need to just show over and over that yes, I can do this. And that is taking time away from us doing the job. It means we have to spend time thinking about and managing how we're being perceived. And that is mental cycles that, again, we're not applying to getting the work done. And we have to spend time compensating for our behaviors so that we aren't too assertive, we aren't too nice, right? Threading that needle all the time of like, how am I showing up? And that has a real cost. It has a cost for us as individuals, um, the mental cost that we have to bear to do that. And it has a cost to society because that is time that is not being spent solving important problems and doing important work. Um, so it is, it is something we should all be concerned about and should all be looking to fix because it is hurting everyone in society. So when I think about this and I think about the double bind, it feels like we have to walk this line, right? We have to constantly be in this balancing act of, am I, Am I being too nice? Is that going to be perceived as weak? Am I being too pushy? Ooh, should I pull back a little bit? Like, am I being bossy? Uh-oh, like, did I say that too aggressively? And it feels like you're always really walking this line. And that can be exhausting. Um, and I think that alone would be frustrating enough if that was all that we were dealing with as women. But um, I read this beautiful piece by a woman um, named Marilyn Fry called The Birdcage. And she talked about that, that the real problem here is that when you look at the double bind, it is a line. But if you zoom out in women's experience, it's actually one line in a, a whole world of lines that create a birdcage that we are trapped inside. Like this is the metaphor. Like if you zoom in on the birdcage, each one of those lines, you think, well, I could get around that. I could figure out how to get around this line. But if you look at all of the experience of discrimination and oppression, it actually becomes a cage that we're trapped in. And I, I pulled out a little quote from her um, essay on this topic, and I, I'm going to put it on the screen, but I'm also going to read it to you because I think the language is really powerful and I want, I want you to hear it um, in, in addition to reading it. So she said, women are caught like this too by networks of forces and barriers that expose one to penalty, loss, or contempt. Whether one works outside the home or not, is on welfare or not, bears children or not, raises children or not, marries or not, stays married or not, is heterosexual, lesbian, both or neither. The experience of oppressed people is that the living of one's life is confined and shaped by forces and barriers which are not accidental or occasional and hence avoidable, but are systematically related to each other in such a way as to catch one between and among them and restrict or penalize motion in any direction. It is the experience of being caged in, all avenues in every direction are blocked or booby-trapped. I think when I read this, like it really spoke to me about experiences I've had that I don't think I could quite put my finger on what really upset me about them, but this helped me understand that it was that feeling of feeling like, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't get around this, this issue. So one example I'll give you from my past is I was um, working in a senior leadership role at a company. My boss, a man who I adored and have a ton of respect for still to this day, he was a champion for me. He was always incredibly supportive. I never felt like he diminished my experience or my opportunity for being a woman. Um, and I got pregnant. And I was getting ready to go out on maternity leave and I was working really hard to set up the whole department so that it could run while I was gone. I was going to be out for three months. Um, I was exhausted. I was pregnant. I was just trying to figure out how to get out the door without, you know, everything falling apart. And um, I was having a meeting with him talking about what I was doing. And at the, at, towards the end of the meeting, he said, can I just stop you for a second and ask you a question? And I was like, sure. And he was like, are you really gonna come back from maternity leave? And something about that question upset me so much. And, and I couldn't in the moment understand totally what it was. It took reflection later for me to really get my arms around it. But I think Marilyn's words really helped me understand it more, which was this feeling of like, whoa, hold on a second. Like, how do I answer that question? in a way that is, is 
helpful or valuable to either of us? Why am I even answering that question at all? Would you have ever asked a man this, right? Like, what are you really saying by asking it? Right? Like everything about it felt so bad, right? And I didn't know what to say in the moment. In fact, what I did is I became defensive and I was like, of course I'm coming back. You know, my job is so important to me. I'd never let my, you know, my parent, my being a parent come in the way of that, which is like bananas that I would even say that, but I felt defensive and scared. Um, and so I think it's this feeling of like, now I'm a woman in a leadership role, but now I'm also a mother. And like, as a mother, should I stay home? Is that what you're telling me? But as a leader, I shouldn't stay home. I should come back to my job. But as you know, and you, and this is the booby trap, right? This is the feeling of like every path is blocked. No matter what I say here, I'm making some wrong choice. If I say I'm coming back, then I'm a bad mom. If I say I'm not coming back, then I'm a bad leader. Right? It's a no-win situation. And it sounds like look, I see in the chat it feels like other people have experienced the same thing. So that's the, that's the birdcage. And that's, I think, the, the challenge that we're trying to overcome here is it's not just one thing. It's many things on top of each other. So this is systemic, right? That's, that's what I want you to hold from, from what I just talked about there is it is built into the system, even if you don't want to be um, hold gender bias, even if you don't want to be sexist, we all do it. Women do it to each other. Men do it to women. You know, it, it's, it's everywhere around us and it's, it locks us in. Um, and that is the key to understanding gender bias is that it's not something somebody chooses to do in some moment, but it is part of the world that we live in. And additionally, I want to mention like the birdcage that I live in, right, that's, that's one set of challenges, but there are compounding biases that I, as a white woman, um, don't even experience, right? So racism and ableism and ageism, right, these things all add more and more bars to the birdcage for women. And so we need to hold on to that. These things are interlocking systemically and create even more challenges depending on the life experience that, that each of us as a woman has. Right, and can make it even more difficult and challenging and painful. So, huh, right? Here we are, ladies. You got this like, mur, mur, I just took you way down, sorry. Um, but but I, I want to inspect this actually, is this feeling that we have, right? Like, this, I, I, I love Lisa, you said, like, the struggle is real. Like, it's like, yep, like, here we are, lived it, felt it. You're, you're preaching to the choir, Rachel, right? Like, we've all experienced it. So, I want to look at like, what is that little sad cloud over our heads? Like, where is it really coming from? And as I think about my own experience, this, what I come to is that it's about a feeling of threat, that it's about a feeling of this constant feeling of being put in a situation where you feel like your relationships, your, um, confidence in your role, your confidence in your ability to retain your job, your confidence in your ability to move forward in your job, that they are under threat when people say things. Yes, it's exhausting, right? Somebody said in the chat, it's tiring, right? It, it's, it wears us out. And so I want to talk to you for a minute here about what threat does inside our brain so we can sort of understand that and maybe we can start to figure out ways to overcome it. So um, I'm going to explain to you a model of the brain um, and, and a model of threat from a guy named David Rock. He wrote a, a great book called Your, um, Your Brain at Work. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen the, this model for the brain. I'm holding up my, if you're not looking at the video, hopefully you are, but I'm holding up my hand and I folded my thumb in across my palm and I rolled my fingers down over the top and I made a fist. So this is a good, this is called the hand model of the brain. Um, this lower part down here, the palm, um, is not Southern Michigan in this example. It's actually your brain stem. Um, and then this folded in part is the limbic system. This is sort of your reptile brain, right? Your emotional brain, it's devoid of language. It's what reacts. And then this is like your executive function, neocortex, right? This is all the good human stuff where we can be like, I'm not gonna eat that Snickers bar right? That's this. Um, so what happens when we are confronted with a threat is that um, we flip our lid. Um, literally, the I mean, it doesn't actually move, but your executive function goes offline and you go all limbic system. You're all response. And um, you guys are probably familiar with the three F's of threat, which is fight, um, flight, or freeze. 
right? This is like built into our brain from the days when we were like, you know, living out in the wilderness. Um, this is how we respond to a threat. Our executive function goes offline. We're all limbic until we can get safe again. So um, somebody asked a question. Yeah, for the QR system answer, she gave us a question in advance for you. Oh, good. Okay, cool. I'm going to hold on to it and um, I'll come back to it. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Cool question. All right. So, so we got this threat system going on. So imagine, you know, you're, you're living out in the savannas and a lion comes at you. Um, your brain goes into threat mode, shuts down everything except the response mechanism. And you're like, ah, break it out. And like either you, you know, freeze, hope it doesn't notice you, you run away, or, you, you know, if you're super brave, you try to kick the lion in the nose, right? Those are the reactions that we get. And while we're in threat mode, like nothing else is working everything else is shut down. We can't engage any of our critical thinking skills. So um, what David Rock talks about in his book is that this same mechanism, it gets triggered in personal interaction situations. We don't have like a separate threat response that got developed when we, you know, gener you know, created modern civilization. We got the same one. It's just that now it's getting set off by things that aren't actual physical threats, but are psychological threats. And so he talks about five psychological threats. Um, he uses the acronym SCARF. Um, and those are threats to our status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And so when I think about somebody saying something to me, like what my boss did, right? Uh, are you really going to come back from maternity leave? I can look at this list and tell you he hit every one of those for me. Suddenly I'm wondering, what does this person really think about me? Like, am I, is my, does he think I'm a good leader, right? My status, am I going to have my job? Like I'm going out on maternity leave. Is this guy telling me like my job may not be here when I come back? Like, do I not get to make these decisions for myself anymore? Is, is he telling me now like, I really think you should come back. And then therefore now I don't get to make this decision for myself. That's autonomy relatedness. Like I love this guy. He's been there for me all through my career. And now all of a sudden he's throwing this garbage at me and fairness. I'm like, would you ask a man this question, right? He hits me on all five of these areas and boom, I am in threat response, executive function offline. And I think we've all felt this when somebody says something like this to us, or we see it said to somebody else, it's like, we can't, think anymore. And I think it's like the kind of ha ha element of this is that moment when you realize later, like, oh, I wish I would have said X, right? Like you come back with the good zinger and like you're kicking yourself that you didn't say it. Well, it's because you couldn't think of it in the moment because your brain is offline. <laughs> All you're doing in that moment is having a threat response. You were in fight, flight, or freeze. So th what threat does is it creates fear and it creates stress, right? And, and what we want instead is to figure out how to be in a reward situation, which is, again, is a brain response. And because when we're in reward is when we're safe and we're creative, right? That's why you can't think of the zinger when you're in the moment, but later when you're with your friends and you're telling them what this jerk said to you, you suddenly realize like, oh, you know what I should have said is X, Y, Z, because now we're in the safe space where our brain is creative. Right? So the challenge for us is if we're constantly having this threat response set off and that it's creating fear and stress, how do we get ourselves back into safety and creativity so that we can actually do something in the moment or after the moment to move the dialogue forward and protect ourselves and advance our goals? Um, so Creativity is the key here. It's getting our brain into the creative spot. So I want to, I want to shift gears now and start talking a little bit about like, so what do we do about this? And I'm going to start with coping strategies. And I call them coping because they do not address systemic gender bias. These are strategies that we as women and allies of women can use in the moment to help us get into that creative mental space and that safe mental space so that we can at least be functional. And, and move forward. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about systemic, systemic um, approaches. So one thing that research has shown women can do, and this is super sucky, is compensate for other people's biases. Like, I will say it again, this sucks. Um, but it's often our only recourse while the gender bias is systemic, right? Is that we have to manage the system. We have to figure out how to navigate a system that is set up to privilege one gender over another. So in the moment of threat, when you are having that, that 
flip your lid experience. Um, what we want to move from is the negative reactions that create fear and stress to a safe space where we can be creative. Sometimes you will have allies who can help you do that. Sometimes you will be alone and you're going to have to figure out how to do it for yourself. Um, and one of the best things that you can do for yourself is give yourself time. Right. In that moment when you flipped your lid, what we have to do is be able to breathe, take a moment, reflect on what's happening, and get that executive function back online. Realize that we are not in physical danger. Yes, we are in psychological danger, but we, we can get back into control of the situation. So giving yourself time is one of the best ways to do that. So this is about making space for yourself. And sometimes that's just having a good repertoire of like, time time taking responses like why are you asking me that or say more about what you're thinking truthfully i don't actually want to know more about what you're thinking but i'm going to say it so you'll talk a little bit more so i can give my brain a second to slow down here or hold on i need to think about what i said and i think the other thing is sometimes we miss the moment sometimes we're so caught off guard or so hurt or upset that we're not going to we're not going to come back in that moment and i think we need to give ourselves some space and some grace for that too it's okay to miss the moment. Um, it's gonna happen to all of us sometimes. But creating time and space for ourselves, I think is, is a really good um, option. I think it's also about identifying small wins and maybe they get to be big wins sometimes too. Um, so this is from a great article about managing the gender norms of leadership that I read. The first time I read it, it was an interview with a bunch of senior leadership women and it was like, how do you deal with this? And they were like, here's a bunch of terrible things I have to do to navigate this world. And I got really mad when I read it. And then I was like, hold on a second. Like these, we do need these coping strategies. Um, and I think what they talked about is adapting to the situation. I think this comes back to, you know, nice first assertive second, right? What is the first thing somebody's going to notice about you? That you're a woman. Okay. So be nice first, then be assert, then bring the assertive next because you've, um, you've met the qualifications for acceptable woman, right? Now you get to be expected leader. Um, I think looking for value-driven opportunities is a really cool idea. This is that place of where do nice and tough converge. Um, things like reframing vulnerability, I think are a good example of that, right? This, this like taking concepts and taking values and talking about how they can be both um, soft and hard skills at the same time. Um, so I think there's strategies that we can employ to help manage the biases, but again, I would call these coping strategies. Um, so I think one last um, place where I think women can help themselves and help each other is um, getting more credit for what they do. This is again, based on research by Madeline Heilman. She um, did a bunch of research into looking at how women often don't get credit for work especially when they are collaborating. And since I know a bunch of you are in the agile world, we know that we're doing a lot of collaborative work. And the research shows that when you're on a collaborative team, men are much more likely to get the credit for the results than women. And so if you're in that situation, um, advocate for yourself. Make sure that you, people know what you did to deliver. Um, do a little self-promotion. Make sure that you're clear about the role you play on this collaborative team. Um, and even doing things like raising your hand to be the spokesperson for the team can give you um, visibility that can help people remember that like there were women on this team too. Um, okay, so those are coping strategies. I want to talk about system strategies. So what are we going to do so that we don't have to do all these coping strategies anymore? How are we going to fix this systemic problem of gender bias? Um, and the answer is um, remembering that we have this continued threat situation, right? That this is what's happening in our brain. It is costing all of us, men and women, the valuable thinking promise of half of the population while we are dealing with these issues, right? It is repeated threats to our very identity, right? So it's worth putting in the effort. And what we need to do to fix the system is overthrow the patriarchy. Now, if that made you chuckle a little bit and you were like, wow, Rachel, like that's a, that's a funny thing to say. Um, I think it's really interesting to ponder why we have this kind of funny reaction to that statement. Um, and maybe some of you had like a yes, like I love the yes, like, but, but I'm serious. And I think the challenge here with this, this concept of overthrowing the patriarchy is that we are way down a rabbit hole of gender bias because even the terms feminism and patriarchy have been gendered, right? When we think about feminism, 
we think about women. When a man says he's a feminist, that feels weird. Why? Why couldn't a man be a feminist? Why isn't a man it totally acceptable to be an advocate for women, right? And when we say patriarchy, I think many of us in our minds go to this place, like if I say overthrow the patriarchy, are we thinking like, Rachel, do you hate men? Do you not want men to have things? You wanna take things from men, right? These are thoughts that people have, but the patriarchy doesn't refer to men. And it doesn't mean that we think there's some sort of male conspiracy to seize power. This is from this article. What patriarchy means is a society that privileges men over women. And that's what I think we have to overthrow. We have to create a society that values men and women equally and doesn't expect different things from either side, right? It doesn't benefit men any more than women to have these gender biases in play because it puts expectations on both sides about who we are and how we show up and what we should do. So if you hold in your mind this idea that what the patriarchy is, is a society that privileges men over women, then I come back to what we need to do is overthrow the patriarchy. We have to fix the system that, that privileges men over women. And this is not an easy job. Systemic change is long-term, takes a lot of effort, and it takes all of us. Um, and it's worth it because while this system is in place, we're all losing. Because when women spend time proving their value, proving their competence, managing other people's biases, just advocating for a fair chance, then that means we're not doing the great work we could be doing and bringing our wonderful skills and talents and promises to the world. And that hurts everyone. That hurts everyone. So, what are we gonna do about this systemic problem? Well, we all have some internal work to do because as I said, this is in the air we breathe, it's all around us. And so we all hold implicit biases. It is everywhere around us. Women engage in gender bias too. I do it, you do it, we all do it. Know that we have these and explore them. Think about the ways that you reacted to certain words or ideas that I talked about today, or when you're looking at the media landscape or interacting with other people at work. Pay attention to your own reactions. Know that it will be uncomfortable. Um, know you'll make mistakes. I probably made mistakes in the way I was talking about this today, right? We are imperfect and we have to be willing to take the risk if we're going to make change. Um, and use your power, right? I love that we have allies here, right? Men can be our strongest allies in this because you already have the power, right? You are in a much stronger position to make change inside the system than women are. So having you be our allies really helps us make better progress. White women, as I said, like we have much more power than women of color do. We need to leverage that power to help every woman be more successful. And if you are a leader or you're an investor with money or you're a person who makes hiring decisions or you coach other people, you have power that you can use to help shape a system that does not privilege one gender over the other. Um, so allyship, um, whether you're a woman ally or a, a male ally, right? We can all be allies. Um, some things you can do is speak up, right? If you hear something, say something, you know, call it out. It's uncomfortable to do that. We don't like to rock the boat, but this boat needs rocking, right? We got to start saying things. Like if you hear somebody being told like they're bossy or she's emotional, right? Call it out, say something, talk about why that language is being used. I think if you're in a position to evaluate people, either as a leader or an HR person or a, a recruiter, imagine a reverse gender when you're thinking about that person. Identify the biases that you're holding. And we can all promote women's accomplishments um, and shine more of a light on what women are doing and all of the great work that we're bringing. Um, overcoming systemic gender bias is a journey. We it, it is not gonna be something we fix overnight. Um, and so we need each other and we need constant attention and conversation about it and that will be tiring but it's the work we'll have to do to make this journey successful all right so there the double bind um i was i want to get to your questions so i was like let's get to it um i'll stop there and i don't know rob if you were grabbing them or if i should scroll back through the chat um i think there are a couple that um if you guys have questions um we can let you um use the chat feature and I can read them or mm -hmm. there's a very long one right there. Um, yeah, the one about the um, women bullying other women. Right now, John just had another one. There's another one after. Do you want to read through them? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I know Anne had a question about women are two and a half times more likely yeah. than other, other women and yeah. your experiences. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's some great research on that too, Anne. I love that question. Um, I didn't bring it into this presentation, um, but there's a couple different dynamics I think that are at play in that. One is if, if positions of leadership are limited for women, if there is tokenism going on or other things where it's like there will only be one or two, um, that sets up a comp competitive environment, which is unhealthy. Um, so that, that, that can be part of what's going on. Um, there's also um, research around, um, and I'm going to forget the name of the theory right now, but I'll, I'll look it up and send it out to you. But there's a, a theory about um, based on research about how people defend the system that they are in, even if it doesn't benefit them, right? So that it, it's, um, it's sort of like the, we, we want the status quo feels safer than the unknown. And so even if the system we are in hurts us, we will often defend it um, strongly over a potential alternative system that we don't understand or know. And so there's evidence of this. You can look at like um, economic policies where you might have economic policies in place that are, are detrimental to certain groups. And there can be evidence from other countries that like these economic policies would actually be better, but the people who are being most hurt by the current economic policies will actually advocate to keep them versus going to the new ones because they're unknown. And so I think, there's probably other things at play here too with female bullies, but I think those two things might be interesting to sort of think about is how, how does a woman who's in a leadership role that she maybe had to fight hard to get become a defender of the very system that is keeping that kept her down and then is ultimately keeping other women out of that. Um, not, I'm not justifying that behavior. It's never right to bully other people, but I think there's some, um, sociological and psychological theories that sort of explain that negative behavior. Feel free to add more, more thoughts there, but that's where my head initially went. Yeah. Uh, Anne, is that uh, good? Do you want to add anything? You may have some other ideas, Anne, from what you've seen. She says, thank you. So. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Oh, I like this uh, in large corporate environments, though HR is not an ally. Yeah. That can definitely be true. Um, I uh, want HR to be an ally. <laughs> well, I'm saying she just asked, how do you respond when your male boss wants to be vulnerable? Oh, when your male want when your male boss does the boss want to be vulnerable? He wants you to be vulnerable. He want um, me to be vulnerable. Is he being vulnerable too? Nope. Oh, well, that's rude. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it, so vulnerability at work um, is something I'm a big advocate for, because I think what vulnerability looks like at work is being a, being willing to say things like, um, I don't understand what you're saying, or I disagree with your idea, or I don't know how to solve this problem. And I think those are things that we really need to be able to say at work, but they require safety, um, right? The, if we don't trust the people we're with, we won't be vulnerable. And then we won't have honest conversations that help actually move our work forward. Um, and so when, when I read that and you say he's not being vulnerable, my sense is that it doesn't feel safe to be vulnerable. Um, and if, if he's not creating an environment of safety, I could understand why you wouldn't want to. But if he's willing to be vulnerable in conjunction with you and create safety to have these conversations, then I think that's awesome. Um, but it doesn't sound like necessarily that's what's happening here. Is that right? You see me? Yep, thank you. Yeah, I mean, don't put yourself in danger. But I think we can all be advocates to bring in better practices and higher safety in our teams. And I also think it's about if you work in a highly unsafe environment, um, can you find allies within that environment to, to at least share your experiences with and get support from? Um, I worked at a super toxic company earlier early in my career. Um, 
very unhealthy company. The CEO turned out later we figured out um, that he he was experiencing some mental illness, but in the moment we didn't know that and his behavior was becoming very erratic and he was constantly threatening us with being fired and being walked out the door. He just was be, be, being very abusive. Um, and yeah, just such an unhealthy environment. And um, in that environment though, I what I reflect back on is I made some of my closest friends that I've ever had um, in my work life. And I think, uh, unfortunately or fortunately in that deeply unhealthy environment, we found each other um, and built relationships that helped kind of protect us and help us feel some modicum of safety. Um, so I don't know if that, that, that's not how I would have wanted that world to turn out, but I needed that in order to feel like I could sort of move forward with my, my job and my life. Um, yeah. Looks like Jess has a question. If anybody wants to chime in, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask if you want to. Yeah, please. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, the, yeah, so how do you respond? Okay. Um, so if a female had to become a bully to address systemic issues, should we can? <laughs> Interesting, Jess. Um, I guess my, in my definition of bully, um, no, we shouldn't bully people. Um, I think well, but I think being, so if, if bully is being gendered to instead just mean a woman with a strong voice who's advocating for justice, then great, she's like, let's do that. But if a bully is somebody who um, intentionally diminishes or demeans other people um, to hurt them, to make themselves feel better, then no, I don't want to champion that behavior, no matter what but, the intended outcome is. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Yes. Yeah, but so what if they've had to learn to bully? And it's a hard thing because we know how this all works with us. And, and mm -hmm. so they've had to learn to bully in order to be heard. Mm -hmm. But along the way, they've actually become the bully. Yeah. So where they champion the female and they champion being heard at the end of the day, even us females were like, well, you could have like toned it down. And we're not talking toned it down in terms of the female be, be nice type of a toned it down, toned it down so that you weren't so abrasive. Yes. And yeah. I don't know if that's me or that's that or what, you know, yeah. it, it's a, it's a hard thing. Yeah. I mean, you're like really pointing out like a, a, a very difficult element of this because, because these stereotypes are in the system Sometimes it's hard to tell if we even as individuals are like, so am I judging her behavior differently because she's a woman or is she really just being rotten? Right? Like, which is kind of what I hear you say, right? Like, is she being That's exactly it. Like, exactly it. Yeah, like, right. Like, so is it me? What am I seeing here? Right? right. Like, yeah. Like, what am I but, seeing? But then here? you try and take yourself out of it. And if you, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we do this. Mm -hmm. Let me take myself out of it and let me see if this was a male acting in that manner, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is funny in and of itself. Yeah. And, and, and then you judge it in terms of if a male did that, then yes, that's how I feel. So then that must be how it is. Yeah. Sad I think, as that is. I think that's probably right. I mean, I think you're, you're going down the right path, which is, can I get myself into a mental frame where I imagine a guy saying this? I mean, it could be even in interesting if you could like record some of her language and then like get a male colleague to say it to you and be like, how would I react if this person was saying it? And if you're having the same reaction, then yeah, they're just being rotten, right? And that's not okay. And, and uh, gender bias doesn't mean that women never engage in um, behaviors that are unacceptable, right? That's, that's fair, fair space for all humans. Um, I think that what we wanna be careful about, and I think that the line you're walking is, are we judging equally the behavior of people or are we putting expectations on one group that we wouldn't put on another? And that is hard. Um, I also like that. Yeah, Karen, I, I like what you're bringing up here. So about this, like it's this, the challenge even within ourselves because we're, we're self-policing, right? And self um, assessing and saying like, Oh God, was I too assertive in that moment? Was I, was I pushy? Are they get you know, was I, should I go back and apologize for the way I said that? Or like, was I too, too rough or like, are they going to think? Yeah. I think that's, um, 
that is part of that like mental hijacking that I talk about that systemic biases bring is that we're this self-management is taking our mental focus away from just doing our jobs. And now we're like analyzing our behavior all the time, um, which is really problematic. Um, and one of the reasons why we want to get rid of this and just be able to evaluate people on their performance. Right. Um, yeah, it depends on each individual person. Yeah. Yeah, and individual perceptions of, of what is appropriate, um, a appropriate way to interact with each other matter too, right? Some people are maybe more used to environments where people are more aggressive and combative and some people are more accommodative. I mean, this gets to kind of core power style. Um, I, I think there's two power styles, more assertive and more accommodative. And I think we all have sort of a core that we come from. We learn how to employ the other power style, but we have a place that we kind of comfortably go back to um, and it's not the same for everyone. And so I know like I tend to be more accommodative. Um, I can even see in my childhood, I was the peacekeeper at my house versus like my sister is more assertive, right? And so that can cause even conflict between us. So power style, I think men or women is something um, that we need to learn to work with, but again, can be bound up in gender identity as well. All right. I know we've reached the top of the hour. Yeah. I mean, if um, anybody has any other questions, you can either chat them over or ask. If anybody, you know, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. I don't know if Rachel have a few minutes. Mm -hmm. If anybody has to get off, um, I know it's six o'clock Eastern time here. People sometimes have family obligations, but. Um, it's, co it's cocktail time, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> Five o'clock somewhere. Uh, six o'clock so, somewhere. Yeah. Thank you yeah. all. Um, but thank you guys. If anybody has any questions, um, you know how to reach me. You've got my email, my phone number. I'm at michiganagiletraining.com. Rachel and I are talking about doing a, um, an agile leadership workshop for women um, in the fall. So if you're interested, um, you know, let us know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous, no more questions. I could stick around if anybody wants to ask any other questions or, you know, Rachel. Yeah, Lisa. Rob, are you going to share the video with us? Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's um, it's going to be um, uh, it is recorded. I'll share it on LinkedIn and uh, I'll upload it to YouTube and, and share it via LinkedIn and my Twitter feed as well. So and you, I can PDF my slides you, and send them to you, Rob. Thank you so okay. much for being here. Yeah, I'll PDF my slides and send them. If people would like those, you're more than welcome to them as well. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, you can. So, social media. Um, I. Uh, linked, catch me on LinkedIn. Um, I have like bursts of, uh, of commentary on Twitter. Um, right. you'll, you'll get more of my personal in addition to my professional on Twitter. It's at Rachel A. Weston. Um, but yeah, find me on LinkedIn and I, I try to yeah. post yeah. good stuff there. Yeah, what I'll do is when I post a LinkedIn, the uh, a link to the video, I'll, I'll tag you, Rachel. Some people cool. will. Thank you. Um, so. Thanks, everyone. If there's no other questions or comments, I'll uh, get ready to, to log off fairly soon. There's a few people hanging on. Does that mean people have questions? Anybody want to say anything? Unmute yourself if you do. Thanks, Liliana. <laughs> I see you waving. <laughs> Just waiting to see if anyone else has any comments that I want to listen to. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> All right. We're all just lurking. I love lurkers. All right. I'm going to end it and say thanks, guys. And keep <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. This was great stuff. Really appreciate it. Thank okay. you, everybody. Have a good evening. Super. Thank you.